Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Lorene Tuttle and I have been having a little argument as to the relative merits of... Having a little discussion regarding two different schools of literary thought. I've been maintaining to Mr. Price... You may call me Vincent. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Vincent. I've been maintaining that our whole lives are enriched by the warmth and beauty of romanticism. Romanticism, my dear Lorene, is for those weak, lily-livered individuals who haven't the courage to face the realities of life. Realism is life. Now, I'll take Eugene O'Neill any day in preference to Winnie the Pooh. And I'll take Cinderella any day rather than Hedda Gabler. Cinderella. Now, she's exactly what I mean. A smudge-faced juvenile delinquent, if you ask me. It's only one of the most beautiful fairy tales ever told. I defy any realist to tell such a moving story. Oh, you would, eh? Well, very well. To prove my point, I'll tell the real story of Cinderella. Very well, but ladies first. Please. To prove my point, I'll tell the romantic story of Cinderella. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, Ed Verdier and Don Clark's dramatic excursion into the realm of realism versus romance as the workshop presents Speaking of Cinderella or If the Shoe Fits. Starring Vincent Price and Lorene Tuttle. Special music composed and conducted by Jeff Alexander. Vincent, are you listening? Once upon a time in a faraway country, there lived a lovely young girl named Cinderella. Unfortunately, she had a cruel stepmother and two stepsisters who were hard-hearted and ill-tempered. Poor Cinderella worked like a slave during the day, and in the evening she would sit alone in the chimney corner among the ashes. Now it happened that the king of the land was giving a ball, and all the people of rank and fashion were invited. Among these were Cinderella's two stepsisters. I'm really very well pleased that my two daughters have been invited to attend the king's ball. Oh, oh so, so are, are we, we Mama. Mama. It has been rumored that the king's eldest son, the prince, is to choose his bride from among the young ladies who will be present. Oh, the prince is so tall and handsome. So gallant and rich. And don't forget, one day his bride will become queen of the kingdom and will rule over all the subjects in the domain. Dear stepmother. What? Oh, it's you, Cinderella. What do you want? Dear stepmother, could I, too, go to the ball? What? You? Have you taken leave of your senses, girl? You have no clothes, only those tattered old rags you're wearing. There are ashes in your hair. Your shoes are broken and scuffed. With very little trouble, I believe I could make myself quite presentable. You, a scullery maid. Presentable. Well, I've never heard of such conceit. I beg of you, stepmother. A simple little dress. I could wear a flower in my hair. That will be all from you, you impertinent ragamuffin. Back to the kitchen. Do you hear me? Back to the kitchen this instant. <laughs> and so poor Cinderella went back to her chimney corner and wept bitter tears. She knew that. Wait she... a minute. Wait a minute. Now, there's as fine an example of flapdoodle as I've been exposed to in my whole life. What do you mean, flapdoodle? This Cinderella character. Why, the way you romanticists picture her, the poor girl needs an analyst. Oh. What on earth is she doing groveling around in the fireplace getting ashes in her hair? Nobody could ever be like that. Now, do you want to know what really happened? Well, I don't think so. It would do you good, Lorene. Facing reality, you understand. Well, this gal, Cindy, wasn't getting much of a break, but she didn't take it sitting down. She knew she had to play it smart, 
So when a rich man in town sent out bids for a big wing ding he was throwing, Cindy was all ears. I'm certainly glad you girls have been invited to Mr. King's party. It should be real nervous. Yeah, when he throws one, it's really a rocket. You can say that again. The last one we went to, I was hung over for three days. I read in somebody's column, Winchell's, I think, that the old man has given his son the word to get married and settle down. Get the possibilities? I understand the guy's quite a wolf. So what? And don't forget that someday he'll be a vice president of King Betancourt Bagby and Wince, one of the biggest advertising agencies in the world. Well, no wonder they call him the prince. So, if one of you girls latch on to him, you'll have it made, but good. Hey, how about me crashing this brawl? You, Cinderella? You must be blowing your stack. <laughs> now I've heard everything. <laughs> Ah, go up on the roof and feed your pigeons. Knock it off, you two, or I'll belt your one in the teeth. Don't pull any of your lady wrestler stuff on my gal. I would have been a champ by this time if you hadn't made me throw those last two matches. I had gorgeous Gloria's shoulders pinned to the canvas when you... What are you beefing about? You got your cut? Yeah, then you took me for the whole bundle shooting craps. Look, do I make this party or don't I? You don't. Besides, you haven't got a thing to wear. You're loaded. You might part with a little grab. I could pick up a nifty little number at Orbox for a few bucks. That's enough out of you, Cinderella. Get back to the kitchen and wash the dishes. And get the dried egg yolk off the plates for a change. Uh, don't give me that lift, that load, tote, that bail routine. I got other plans. Cinderella, where are you going? Down to Dirty Joe's Bar and Grill, that's where. That horrible, smelly dive down on the waterfront? I've smelled worse. But the dock workers are having labor trouble down there. You're... Don't worry your empty head about me, Steffi. I can take care of myself. Be seeing you. Oh, I have never, never in all my life heard anything so outrageous. <laughs> Vincent, you, you, you should be ashamed of yourself. Distorting that lovely story and making Cinderella such a horrible character. Well, at least she has spirit. She isn't the namby-pamby little goop you'd want the public to accept. My Cinderella is a charming child, unspoiled, sweet, and naive. Oh, she's naive, all right. She's so naive, she's simple in the head. She ought to be in an institution. That isn't true. She has all the personality of an oyster. Why doesn't she stand up for her rights? Because she's a dear, obedient child. Well, a good psychiatrist might help her, but I doubt it. Your Cinderella was trying to escape reality by indulging in daydreams about a fairy godmother. Fairy godmother. <laughs> it wasn't that way at all. You see, there really was a fairy godmother. You don't say. Yes. So, when her two stepsisters had left for the ball, dressed in their beautiful gowns, Cinderella went sorrowfully to the kitchen sat down in the chimney corner and broke into sobs of unhappiness. At this moment, a beautiful fairy appeared. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> stop your crying, my child. I am your fairy godmother, Cinderella. If you wish to go to the king's ball, you shall. But you must do everything I say. Yes. Oh, yes, of course. First, bring that pumpkin out into the garden. Where shall I put it? Yeah, right there. Yeah, that's right. Now, I'll touch it with my magic wand like this. And... There. Oh, my. A splendid coat, all gold and silver. Oh. Now, bring me those six mice in yonder trap. Yes. All right. But... Shall I do with them? Let's put them there, in front of the carriage. Yeah, that's it. So, a touch of my wand and... <laughs> Six white horses with golden harness and red and blue ribbons in their manes. Fairy godmother, it's wonderful. Oh, well, my dear, is this not a fit equipage to take you to the king's ball? Indeed. Indeed it is, but... But... I have no suitable gown. All I have are these tattered rags. Oh, yes. We'll soon take care of that. Oh, how lovely. A white 
satin gown covered with pearls and diamonds and tiny slippers of glass spun as fine as gossamer. How can I ever thank you, dear, dear fairy godmother? By being happy. But hear me, there is one condition. You must not remain at the ball after the clock strikes twelve. If you do, your coach and horses will all return to their natural forms and your fine gown will again turn to rags. Oh, I promise I'll leave the ball at the very first stroke of twelve. <laughs> then off with you, my darling, and have a merry time. You've been so good to me. So very, very good. <laughs> And so, in all her finery, Cinderella started off for the king's ball, looking more like a princess than anyone who would be there. Cinderella was very happy. Oh, what stuff and nonsense, really. In all my born days, it I have never... It wasn't that enchanting, my dear. Enchanting? It was appalling. Appalling? Moreover, it doesn't make any sense. Cinderella's stepmother obviously has money. She thinks nothing of getting Dior and Adrian gowns for her daughters. But still, her place is overrun with mice and rats. Why, if the Board of Health You ever... are getting more odious by the minute. Odious, schmodious. Let's get back to reality. And the way the story really happened. Now, this Cinderella kid wants to go to the ball, all right. But instead of falling back on her schizophrenic escape pattern, why doesn't she do something constructive? Now, actually, she does. Such as what? Such as this. <laughs> When Cinderella left her mother's house, she was pretty steamed up about the treatment she'd got. So, as she said, she went to Dirty Joe's down on the waterfront, where she could get a short beer and think things out. Hi, Dirty Joe. Hiya, Cindy. How your pigeons? Joe, you know Crummy. Crummy? Yeah. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Crummy who? You know, Crummy McRodder. Oh, him. He comes in here all the time, doesn't he? Yep. You see him tonight? Yep. You mean he's been in? Sure. When did he come in? About an hour ago. Did he say where he was going when he left? Nope. How long ago did he leave? He didn't. Huh? You mean he's still here? Yeah, over there, in the last boot. Oh, thanks. I mean, thanks. Hi, Crummy. Hi, a bright girl. How's the pigeons? Mind if I sit down? What's to stop you? That sawed-off shotgun. Oh. I'll move it over here. Why the artillery? Things are tough on the water for right now, Bright Girl. The boss wants us band boys to play soft, sad music as a warning to the dock wallopers who ain't kicking in. Yeah. Who's the target for tonight? Guy by the name of Gus Guggelheimer plays a glockenspiel. He run out on us. And what's on your mind, Bright Girl? Look, Crummy, I I'm going to put it right on the line with you. I need some dough. Oh, sure. Who don't? I need a slick drape and I'm a... sorry, bright girl. You can't put the bite on me for nothing like that. I don't need much, Crummy. Just a couple of C notes. Hey, what do you think I am? Your fairy godmother or something? If you need some scratch, get it from your old lady. Ah, uh, she wouldn't give me a dime. That's too bad. Now, uh, the way I hear it, she keeps plenty of ice around the place. Hey, and... the wall's safe. I mean, you got something there. You know how to crack a safe. You ain't just beating your gums, baby. I got ten years in Alcatraz to prove it. All right, then. Now, here's what we'll do. Listen. You getting it, Crummy? Will you shut up and leave me listen? One thing I've got to remember. Yeah, what's that? Except for the bracelet I'm going to give you for this caper. I've got to put back all the rest of the jewels before midnight. There's a time lock on this safe, and it's set for 12 o'clock. I got it open. <laughs> hey, there's plenty of loot in here. Wait a minute. Get your cotton picking hands off that stuff. Mm. Oh, no. Here's a bracelet. Must be worth a grand, at least. Uh, give me two C notes, and it's yours. Then you better add an extra sawbuck for cab fare. Well, here's a 200, but not another cent. I made a sucker deal, if you ask me. All right, all right. Don't give me the extra 10. I'll just have to heist a car to get to the party. That's all. <laughs> 
Code 3, 768 w 4 hf 22 Be on the lookout for a pumpkin yellow Cadillac convertible just stolen from the corner of 4th and Spruce Streets. Repeating, code 3, 768 w 4 hf 22 You see what I mean? My Cinderella is a realist. She has spirit. Oh, really, Vincent? You know this whole thing is impossible. I don't quite agree with you. Your version of the Cinderella story is impossible. Mine is possible. But uh, continue, my dear. Well, I'm not sure that I want to, but I suppose I must if any semblance of dignity and decorum is to remain in this lovely story. (laughs) Well... When Cinderella arrived at the king's palace, she was surrounded by courtiers who led her into the ballroom. All eyes were directed toward her, for everyone was struck by her grace and beauty. No one knew who she was. Even her cruel stepsisters did not recognize her. So rich and splendid was her dress. All the king's courtiers, one after another, asked Cinderella to dance, and they were all highly pleased with her grace and elegance as well as enchanted by the wit and brilliance of her conversation. The prince himself arrived quite late. Seeing Cinderella, he so admired her appearance and manners, he immediately offered her his hand to the dance. What a charming creature you are. Tell me your name, I pray. That I cannot do, sir. And please do not press me to tell it. I am sure you must be a princess from a distant kingdom. Really? What makes you say such a thing as that? No one but a princess could wear as magnificent a gown as yours, encrusted with precious gems and jewels. And no one but a princess could be so beautiful and so beguiling. You will turn my head with the sweetness of your words, my prince. And indeed... What is that? It is the tolling of the curfew bell. What o'clock is it? Tell me quickly. It is midnight. I must go. I must leave at once. I beg you to stay yet a while, for you dance with the likeness of a butterfly on the soft summer breeze. I cannot stay. I cannot. My heart prompts me to tell you that I love you, for I have never seen a maid so fair. No. No, please let me go. Good night, my prince. My prince charming. Good night. In her haste to leave, my beautiful princess has left her slipper behind. A slipper of glass spun as fine as gossamer. I vow I shall find my lovely princess if I must search all the kingdoms of the world, for I would make her my wife. Now there's a real basis for a successful marriage. (laughs) The prince has one dance with Cinderella. One dance, mind you, and he wants to marry her. Why not? I wonder what a marriage counselor would say about that. Must you be so literal? And she is such a bird brain, she runs off leaving one of her shoes behind. It was a slipper of glass, spun as fine as gossip. And those two stepsisters of Cinderella's, they can't be very bright. They're right there at the ball, and they don't recognize her just because she's wearing a new dress. Now, I ask you, what sort of an IQ would those two have? Now, you take my Cinderella. You take her, and you can have her. My Cinderella has moxie. She goes after what she wants. No fairy godmother nonsense about her. When she arrived at Mr. King's party, the place was really jumping. The minute she wiggle walked into the joint, all the cats began to yowl. Get a load of a babe, wow. Hey, it's a doll, a real living, breathing doll. Hey, looky, looky, hiya, cookie. Ah, uh, get away from me, short, fat, and repulsive. Come on, sweet mama, how about pinning on a cheek? Let's live it up for real. Drop dead, cornball. What's with you, beautiful? You mad in this mad, mad world? Mister, I'm just not playing the field, that's all. What I'm looking for is the favorite. Where's the prince? In the rumpus room, lapping up some corn squeezes, I suppose. Thanks, chum. See you around the bowling alley sometime. Man, dig that crazy, crazy walk. Real cool, man. Cool. Yeah. Well... Hiya, babe. You the character they call the prince? That's right. My old man is J. Walter King, a King, Betancourt, Bagby, and Winch. Sure, I know. You're in the advertising racket. Big deal. Ah, you know something? 
You're okay. Sounds as if this advertising dodge pays off in blue chips. You mind if I park the bustle? My dogs are killing me. Yeah, sit right here next to me, doll. That's it. Would you like a slug gun? Yeah, I don't mind if I do. Uh, double bourbon on the rocks with a twist of lemon peel. There you are. I like you, sweetie. You're a real dish of stuff. Oh, it's the spot. Fill her up again, Buster. <laughs> you and your old men are throwing quite a bash tonight. Uh, entertaining the sponsors is what they call an occupational headache. Oh, yeah, I'll bet. I met a couple of the jokers when I came in. Well, here's mud in your eye, Prince. Cheers. That's a real sharp bunch of threads you're filling. It's just a little something I picked up. And diamonds and pearls. Yeah, I picked them up, too. So you're the original man in the gray flannel suit, huh, kiddo? Ah, I suppose one of these days I'll make vice president. How come you haven't pressured your old man before this? He's just made me an account executive for Bimbo's No Bunyan Shoes, but I think he's thrown me a curve. The radio and TV ratings are doing a nosedive. What you need is a gimmick, Princey. Ah, you can say that again. Come on. They're playing a rock and roll, and that's for me, sugar. Okay, honey. A gimmick, I think. No giveaway, no panel. These kind of notes really send me. A gimmick that... Oh, doggone it. What's the matter, baby? I'm losing my slipper. Hey, wait a minute, Princey. Wait a minute. I think I got your gimmick. What's with you? You flipping your lid or something? No, listen. I leave my slipper behind when I leave here tonight. Nobody knows who I am, so you put big ads in the newspapers and buy spots on radio and television. A coast-to-coast campaign, a big build-up in Ballyhoo to find the bimbo no bunion shoe girl. You got it, Princey? Hey, I really think you got something there. Jumping catfish, is that 12 o'clock? Sure is. The time lock on the wall safe. This stuff's got to be back there before midnight. I gotta scram out of here. What are you yakking about? If I don't get going right now, I'm a dead pigeon. Uh, here's my slipper. You take it from there. So long, Princey. Do you see how competent and constructive my realistic Cinderella has turned out to be? She's scheming and conniving and... Actually dishonest. Oh. She stole her stepmother's jewelry. Oh, nonsense. She only borrowed it for a little while. She's hurrying home right now to put it back in the wall safe. How about the bracelet she gave to Cummy? Don't you worry about my girl. She's ingenious. She'll find some way of getting around that. She's an uncouth, unprincipled creature. Well, at least she isn't inane and innocuous like your girl. But please, go on with your story. Thank you. The prince searched everywhere for Cinderella. But alas, he could not find her. And when his search had quite failed, he grew ill with disappointment and vexation. Then the king, who dearly loved his son, called a privy council and asked his ministers what was to be done. They decided to send out heralds throughout the kingdom, proclaiming that the prince would marry the lady who could wear the tiny slippers spun of glass as fine as gossamer. <laughs> The slipper does not fit you, my lady. Oh, dear, I'm so disappointed, Prince. Let me try, sister. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It does not fit you either. I felt so certain it would. Let the modest little girl who is standing back there come forward. Why, why it is you, my princess. Despite your modest garments, you cannot conceal your identity from me, for I see you through the eyes of love. Now, we'll try on the slipper. Yes, my prince. It fits. The slipper fits. Come to my arms, my darling, my own true princess. My prince. My prince charming. <laughs> And so they were married and lived happily ever afterwards. 
Now, wasn't that a sweet and lovely story? To be perfectly frank with you, Lorena, I found it rather dull and pedestrian. Oh, Vincent. Well, in my version, there is action and excitement. My Cinderella is real and colorful. And I suppose your story has a sordid ending like so many realistic stories. She probably went to the penitentiary and the advertising man was sent to the Chicago office. No, Lorene, not at all, not at all. Listen. This is your newscaster, Thomas Lowell. The search for the bimbo no bunion shoe girl continues. She has been reported seen in St. Louis, Altoona, and Tibet. Cinderella, turn off that radio. There are rumors that... I'm sick to death of hearing about that bimbo no bunion shoe girl. That's all you read about in the newspapers, all you hear on the radio, all you see on the television. And that singing commercial. Where is the bimbo girl and who is she with a no bunion shoe? Bunion shoe. Driving me nuts. Ah, Keep your hair on, kids. It'll be all over tomorrow. It's been the greatest search since Bridie Murphy. And, Dad, the ratings are neat, 43. The bimbo shoe sales are up 72.9. A terrific campaign. This makes you a vice president, my boy. I owe it all to you, Cinderella. Ah, it's okay, Princey. Well, when do we get hitched? Whenever you say, baby. We better see how soon we can line up the network so we can get full coverage. We want this wedding to be a real doozy. Bimbo's no bunion shoes will sponsor the whole works. I better let the press and photographers in. They're getting impatient. You're smooth, Cinderella. Real frantic. Smooth. Oh, and Princey, you're the most. Well, Vincent, at least you had a happy ending. Of course. You see, Loreen, there are all sorts of Cinderella stories. They happen every day, but they all end in exactly the same way. Even today, the beautiful girl can marry the handsome prince. And, of course, they'll live happily ever after. Tonight, the CBS Radio Workshop has presented Speaking of Cinderella, starring Vincent Price and Lorene Tuttle and directed by Don Clark. Original script by Ed Verdier and Don Clark. The cast included Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Louise Arthur, Jean Bates, Vic Perrin, Irene Tedrow, Harry Bartell, Sam Edwards, Peter Leeds, Jack Crucian, and Byron Kane. Original music for tonight's program was composed and conducted by Jeff Alexander. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in Hollywood by William Frug. This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when we present Jacob's Hands, an original news story by Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood. And we are proud to welcome as our narrator the distinguished author, Mr. Isherwood, presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. Sunday, over most of these same stations, the New York Philharmonic Symphony will be heard playing the Brahms Piano Concerto No. 1 in D minor, with Guido Cantelli conducting and Rudolf Fierkuzny as soloist. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these stations by My Son Jeep. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. <laughs> <laughs>